Probably the source of these sounds. That's what they were telling me in here, but uh, it seemed, we see him broadside now. I couldn't tell you the color he's backlit, but... Kind of like gray. Yeah. yeah. But this is nuts, man. This is nuts. Yeah, well now Jays have turned around. I mean, this is definitely uh, behavior. Uh, well, shit, there's no way... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, they're right here, and they got it all on video and sound, and the problem is, uh, I think they're hurting these whales. Yeah. It's off. So these might have been separated? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the J-17s are the J-22s one.
metal when it's hit with high explosive and burns, it turns into oxide particles. And the most deadly form of radiation is the inhaler. It won't cause you to drop dead today, but it's gonna, it not only causes cancer, Yeah, yesterday. There was bombing. There was bombing yesterday, so there's doing some live. If the wind come this way, probably be could be more worse. Yeah, if the wind come from the south, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was bombing in the afternoon. Yesterday. It changes. Yeah. Hawaii is now the headquarters of the oldest and largest of the U.S. Unified Commands, right? Uh, headquartered in Halava Heights above uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, its area of responsibility goes everywhere from the west coast of North America all the way to the central Indian Ocean, from Alaska all the way to and including Antarctica. Right? So most of the area of the planet and the majority of the population of the Earth falls within this area of responsibility. And so I'll take it right there. Um, so the metaphor that uh, Kalekua Ka'eo, a professor of Hawaiian studies in Maui College uh, and an activist, he, he said that the, you could think of Hawaii as the head of a monstrous head. If you think about the military in Hawaii, it's like the head of this octopus, right? As tentacles are reaching out all over the Pacific. This is what it looks like on our islands. Um, the red and yellow areas, are the kind of current and the recent expansion of military lands. Uh, the orange or peach colored are former military lands. So the height of military expansion here was during World War II. They had about 645,000 acres of land in Hawaii. Today it's about 240, well, this is a little bit low, I think it's closer to 240, about 142 military sites. Um, and if you look at Oahu Island, um, it's about a quarter of our island is uh, under military control. So a lot of that you might not notice because it's up in the hills, but uh, you know, we have one of the highest concentrations of military uh, land tenure, you know, close to Guam and Okinawa, I think are the other two that are comparable. These brains of this octopus can be imagined as the, the supercomputers and the command center. This is, this is up at uh, Halava Heights where the Pacific Command is located. Their command center, you know, with their um, um, flat panel screens, the supercomputer in Maui, and all the fiber optics that connect this stuff is like the nervous system. Yeah? The eyes of this octopus, up on top of Maui, they have a tracking station for the Air Force in Koke'e, Kauai, Kaena Point, and even that floating uh, golf ball that comes in and out of Pearl Harbor is part of this um, network of sensors that they have, remote sensors. So that's a sea-based X-band radar, if you don't know. And it's, um, it's a five, I think it's about a five billion dollar project. It's a very expensive experimental radar. It's really powerful and it's meant to protect against missile strikes. So in the same way that Guam gets sort of used to justify militarization, right, and North Korea gets kind of uh, used also as the, as the um, antagonists in this, in this drama. Uh, whenever North Korea talks about doing another missile launch, this thing gets trotted out and, and told somewhere in the Pacific uh, to protect us, <laughs> right? Even though the only reason why North Korea would have a missile aimed at us is, as Ken said, you know, because we've got missiles pointing at them, right? But um, it works. It doesn't, it doesn't work well, um, and it's been critiqued by the, the General Accounting Office and other experts have said it's a very expensive bulldog. Right? But if you think of it as um, a device for, for creating military contracts and continuing military contracts, it works really well. Because every year they get new money, the defense contractors get new money to improve it. So incremental improvements give you a long term lifespan on this kind of a project. The ears of this octopus, sensors off the ocean of Kauai, um, and over in the central Oahu we have uh, the naval. Um, Telecommunic Computer Telecommunications Area Master Station, NC TAMS, and also the National Security Agency Regional Signal Intelligence Center. Right? So if you've, um, if you've heard of Edward Snowden, the guy who uh, blew the whistle on uh, NSA spying and capturing all of our electronic communications, he worked in one of these bunkers underground you know, that was filtering through all of our communications. Right? 
the excrement of an octopus like this is widespread. It can be symbolized by what happened to Pu'uloa, right? Once a food basket is now a giant super farm, which is a, a government list of the most toxic and priority areas for environmental cleanup. Everything from you know, PCB and merc uh, heavy metals, mercury, lead, radioactive cobalt-60, uh, fuel spills, uh, solvents like perchloroethylene, um, and sadly the pearl oysters is now extinct. And so if you go to the shoreline, you'll see uh, signs like this. And one of the most recent uh, incidents we've had is, um, if, you've, if you go over the uh, Monolo Freeway towards the stadium, um, you'll pass over what's called Red Hill, or the Hawaiian name is Kapu Kaki. Under this um, hill are 20 of these uh, giant fuel tanks. Each one is uh, 250 feet high by 100 foot in diameter. The Aloha Tower would fit inside of one of these, right? There are 20 of these tanks buried in the mountain, um, running a tunnel uh, with a pipeline and a small railroad runs underground from there all the way to Pearl Harbor. And um, each tank holds 12.4 million gallons of fuel. Okay. So this was built in secret during World War II. Uh, it's continued, it's still being used, even though over the years they start breaking down and they've had leaks. I think every single tank has leaked over the years. And the latest one in 2014 was 27,000 gallons of jet fuel leaked out. The tanks, you gotta understand that these tanks are 150 feet above the Halava Aquifer. Okay. The bottom of the tank is 150 feet, so 12.4 million gallons times 20, 150 feet over the aquifer, and this aquifer is one of the main sources of fresh water for Honolulu. It provides 24% of the water from Wanunua to Hawaii Kai. So we're all implicated by this uh, threat. Um, the the uh, violence is also indicated by things like the destruction of, of Hawaiian sites, um, and this picture here um, is from um, in Mokapu on the Kaniohe Marine Base. These sand dunes is called, are called Hele Loa. It's one of the um, largest Native Hawaiian burial sites uh, in the Hawaiian Islands. And so they're literally golfing on, on the bones of Hawaiian ancestors. Um, several thousand uh, human remains were removed for a runway that kind of cuts through this area. Um, and uh, they're, they're in boxes at the Bishop Museum. Uh, and Terry's been involved in efforts to try to repatriate these homes. So these are all the kind of the, the negative effects that spill over from the military presence that they, they never really tell you about, right? The excrement of an octopus like this is widespread. It can be symbolized by what happened to Pu'uloa, right? Once a food basket is now a giant super fund, which is a, a government list of the most toxic and priority areas for environmental cleanup. Everything from you know, PCB and mer uh, heavy metals, mercury, lead, radioactive cobalt-60, uh, fuel spills, uh, solvents like perchloroethylene, um, and sadly the pearl oysters is now extinct. And so if you go to the shoreline, you'll see uh, signs like this. And then the tentacles are reaching out to Okinawa and Guam, Kwajalein, Korea, and other places, right? Um, and so it, it centers here, and I guess this is another theme that comes up, is here we have to, I think, be responsible for both, for two aspects. One is the violence of the military occupation in Hawaii on the people and on the land, but also on the consequences of this military occupation for other people around the region, right, who host the bases or who are the targets of war and, and other kinds of military intervention, right. Um, and if you're a fisherman, you ever caught taco or hey, hey, if you cut off a tentacle, it'll grow back, right. So in the Philippines, the bases were kicked out, but um, they're coming back. After September 11, advisors in Mindanao uh, with the conflict in the South China Sea, um, an expansion of the, of the visiting forces agreement to allow more US presence in the Philippines. So we have to deal with the problem at the head. Bohapulo is the other site that's being targeted. It's one of the largest live fire ranges outside the US, and so this is where most of the live fire training is gonna be moving to um, there's all kinds of, of new developments out here, but also a new challenge from Native Hawaiians who are suing the state of Hawaii for its failure to protect these lands, which are being leased from the state to the military. And these are all lands of the Hawaiian uh, trust lands, lands of the former, former lands of the Hawaiian kingdom that were taken over and uh, are, are held in trust by the state. 
So um, this is an ongoing issue over there at, uh, at Bokaloa. Um, just a couple of examples of resistance that I think are um, symbols of, of hope and inspiration. Kahoa Lave was one effort where a small group of activists began the struggle and it grew into a movement which, which eventually stopped the military from bombing Kahoa Lave, right? The smallest of, of the uh, main Hawaiian islands. Um, and so I think it is, it is possible for small groups to leverage its power uh, through networks. And it was really this kind of trans-oceanic um, solidarity with the Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific Movement that helped put a lot of pressure on the United States and its allies to stop bombing Kahoa Lave. Right. So the bombing stopped in 1990, uh, 400 million dollars um, appropriated for cleanup, but only a tenth of the island is actually safe for kind of unrestricted access. Mako Valley is another site where there's ongoing um, struggle. We've, um, it was taken during World War II, there's been a lot of protests, and in 1998, uh, Malama Makua filed a lawsuit to challenge the armies um, for failing to t do an environmental study. And because of that lawsuit and the, the kind of settlement agreement that was reached, uh, the Army's been actually constrained by the court for 14 years now. They haven't trained. So, uh, you know, I think as, as time goes on, it's just proving the point that we've made that the Valley's not uh, needed for lifeguard training, but would be better as a place of Hawaiian restoration, right? environmental restoration, cultural restoration. Um, the, the group, Malama Makua, says this should be at the University of Makua. It should be a place to learn how to restore the earth. And so we've had a ceremony there um, for 14 years now. We've had Makahiki ceremonies in the valley. And so that's a sign of hope. And I think you know, if there's opportunities to go to Makua twice a month through uh, service learning, if anyone's interested in that, you, know, you can talk to us. Um, it's, you, know, it's, you don't get to see everything because they really can try to constrain us. But it's great to be able to get in the valley and see and touch these places, you know, and have the valley speak to you. So, so it's a beautiful place. Um, and with that, uh, I think that's my last slide. So with, with that, I'll just close by um, telling a, a brief story. Um, Atwood Makanani is a Hawaiian activist and a, a voyager. He, he sailed on the Hokulea. And uh, one time when I was, uh, one time when I was, um, driving in a car with him, he told me, you got a haku, right? And I didn't know what he was talking about. And he, you know, he was, uh, when you, in Hawaiian, uh, haku means like to, to braid something or to compose, right? And um, I was like, okay, you know, I have to think about it. She speaks in cryptic ways like this. So I think what he was saying was, you know, by, by weaving together the many strands of our struggles, we can make a role, a, a strand that's much stronger than its individual parts. And hopefully this, um, this thing that we break together can be strong enough to catch and hold those big fish that threaten to eat us all. So, thank you very much. Okinawa is much like Hawaii. It was an independent island nation, sovereign nation, um, with its own uh, foreign policy and so forth. And it was unilaterally colonized by a foreign power. Uh, in their case, Japan. In fact, Okinawa is more a Japanese name for Okinawa. It was formerly known as Luchu or Ryukyu. Uh, but anyways, that, it's important to start off there because um, that, therein lies the relationships of Okinawa today. It was a, colon, a colony, and like Hawaii, it was incorporated as part of the nation uh, unilaterally. And yet it still continues to be treated as a military colony, and uh, people, um, and indigenous people, continue to be tr treated as second-class citizenship. Um, I actually used to live, uh, let's see, Oceanside over there, about over here. This is uh, one of the many bases in Okinawa. Almost uh, 20, about 18% of Okinawa Island is uh, controlled, dominated by um, military facilities. And the thing I should mention about Okinawa is we're talking about an island around the size of Kauai, with a population larger than Hawaii. So you can imagine the incredible density, as you can see, it's an urban jungle, and then you have these huge bases in there. Um, of which um, a lot of problems come with that. Well, to begin with, uh, like I said, um, there's several facilities throughout uh, Okinawa, um, most 19% of the island, and some of the best lands. And I must say that a lot of this land was acquired through what they say bayonets and uh, bulldozers. Well, either it was uh, land that was seized by the Japanese forces that were um, 
militarized for the Japanese side. And then um, if you're familiar with the Battle of Okinawa, again, which uh, devastated Okinawa to this day, um, that, that land was continued by U.S. military. Or while Okinawans were in refugee camps um, and records were destroyed, they were able to obtain um, the best lands in Okinawa. Okinawa consists of 0.6% of the entire Japan land base, and yet it hosts almost 75% of U.S. bases in Japan. So in other words, all these, all these uh, foreign base occupation, they're all concentrated in Okinawa that is a former colony, and they continue to treat it as such. The pivot into Asia, okay, um, you know, currently Trump has been against the TPP, okay, so, but they've been trying to secure this uh, relationship with Japan. And what, what is geared towards is a trilateral military alliance, Korea, Japan, and the United States. And it's creating a new Cold War and instability in a region, economically, politically, as we can see today. Um, it's a real serious, it's not a conspiracy theory, it's really an issue we need to watch. Uh, if there's no other questions, I want to pass this on to some of these other warriors because uh, with this, these struggles are interdependent and we're in solidarity with all the other struggles around the world. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, so, as a result of the struggle of Okinawans against this, um, these military bases, uh, the U.S. had to recalibrate its policy to try to move some of the troops out of Okinawa and into other places, right? So one of the places that's been hit really hard with that realignment is Guam uh, in the Northern Marianas. Uh, and so to speak next is uh, Ken Gofigan Cooper. So what about the military? Where are they in Guam? Well, they're all over, okay? We are at the tip of the spear of the American military um, saber, as Pete said. So we're also not only where America's day begins, where America's colonialism continues, but we are also where America's war begins. 27, or even 28% of the island, is currently occupied by the United States military. And a lot of that land that they acquired was pretty much stealing land after World War II from Chamorros, okay? We are a strategic location. That has always been the reason for them to be here. In 1898, they acquired us, they used us as a coaling station, and then eventually, right, we're seeing, it's all about strategy. It's all about the curse of geography that we are forced to suffer through as of now. But hopefully, with, when I end this presentation, we can imagine geography in a different manner of solidarity. Does anyone know what this is? This is called the DF-26. It's China's first intermediate ballistic missile which pretty much has the capability to reach Guam. It's also dubbed the Guam Killer, okay? So imagine, we're a population of around 160,000 people. Um, most of the time we're pretty chill, you know? But yet we have Chinese dubbed missiles, the Guam Killer. We have missiles that are capable of reaching Guam. Why, why attack Guam? Always refers back to the military. We also face land contamination. This is a very, very detailed chart of all the land contaminations that have happened in Guam. Guam's cancer rates are really, really high, especially with nasal pharyngeal cancer. And most, rec most recently, a bunch of veterans have come out saying that they have sprayed Agent Orange in Guam. But the Department of Defense refuses to acknowledge this, okay? Refuses to acknowledge this, and in the north, where the Anderson Air Force Base is, that's where our aquifer is. That's where the water is. That's where we drink. So this is what we're going through. But this is only Guam. I come from a Marianas archipelago. There's also the Marianas Range Complex, which was pretty much passed in 2010. It's 500,000 nautical square miles. All right, to give that into perspective, it's three times the size of California. 500,000 nautical square miles. And what it does, it gives the military a playground for live fire exercises and weapon testing, such as submarine warf warfare, uh, sonar technology development, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes in Guam, we do have beached wells, okay? So if, if this was not enough, five years later, they said, we're gonna up the ante, okay? And they went through with the Marianas Islands testing and training. 
So it went from 500,000 square miles okay, to 984,000 nautical square miles. So this is larger than the states of Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, Montana, and New Mexico combined. And now that's their playground okay, to do the same thing. All right, Live fire, high impact underwear weapons, and deadly sonar, which will kill precious marine life. Right? So not only do they want the land, they want our ocean. They want our waters. So everything is under threat. This is a picture of the island that they bombed called Farallon de Mendeniza or Noos in the indigenous Chamorro name. Uh, they originally got this with an agreement with what is now called the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. And their lease on the island expires, I believe, 2033, but they, have a, they can have a unilateral extension if they wanted to, I think, to 2083. Now, I want to show you a video. The U this is from the YouTube U.S. military channel. So they're just openly flaunting it. That's what happens. Now with the MIT that passed in 2015, they're gonna drop about, if I'm not mistaken, around close to 6,000 bombs a year on the island. On an interview that my friends in We Are Guahan did with some fishermen that are sort of near there, sometimes they say that during the bombing they can hear the island cracking. Okay, they can hear the island cracking. So, this is a Marianas wide issue. With all of that military overview, a lot of us have said that the answer is independence. That we need to fight for our independence as a sovereign nation. And then we can go to critique the nation state and we can destroy the nation state after we get it. But we have to have the ability to kill our own nation state first. So we're fighting for that. What do we mean by independence? To exercise self-government over one's territory and population, to have sovereignty and to participate on the world stage as equals, and lastly, to create a government that can work for us. This is nothing that we have now. Our government was created through a 1950 organic act by the United States Congress, okay? So we didn't get to formulate that government the way that speaks to us and how we interact with each other, how our relationships dictate um, cultural norms, social values, none of that. That's what we want. We want to be able to become a neutral country we want to be able to form alliances with Oceania and independent Pacific nations to say, keep out of our ocean. Stop contaminating it. Stop threatening our people. Stop using us as a pawn in your imperial games. But we can only really do that if we become an independent nation, right, um, to, on that stage. Granted, we are not going to stop with the people power and the affinity geopolitics, as Sasha Davis says, before that, but this is something that we strive to do. So independence does not mean isolation. It instead allows Guam to enter a network of global interdependence as an equal partner rather than a possession of another. And so what I'm hoping to do here is ask of all of you for two things. Number one, check out Oceania Rising, which is our local um, group here at UH Manoa that speaks about these issues. Also, if you could please sign this, this petition um, that's a long to write, but if you, tech, if you type in Protehila Texan, it's a petition to save Retidian from the degradation and militarization of native lands. This is the ads. Our ancestors used this to carve canoes that sailed the ocean wide and established relationships with fellow Pacific nations. What we're doing is that this ads has been taken from us and futures have been carved by the United States military that are nuclear, that are dangerous, that threaten the lives of my daughter and her children, that threaten the physical integrity of our actual island because of bombing, 
that threaten the ability for our people to self-determine what we want to do. And so in taking back the ads, I envision us carving a new future. And that only happens if we take an approach of solidarity in Oceania. When Oceania comes together and says, I may seem like a small island, but have you seen the ocean and how large it is? Have you seen my brothers and sisters in Kiribati? Have you seen my brothers and sisters in Aotearoa? Have you seen my brothers and sisters in the Solomon Islands, in Palau, et cetera, et cetera? And together, we will ensure that your military, that your imperial agenda will never succeed here. So on this campus, let's start to form that dream. Sizus Masi. to approve the destruction of records related to its detention operations in order to eliminate the paper trail of human rights and constitutional abuses, including sexual assaults and deaths under ICE custody. Does that remind you of anything? Destroying records to hide war crimes. Destroying records to hide human rights violations. If that doesn't sound like fascism to you, you need to read more about what fascism is. Yeah. We're living in it. Is there anything more fascist, Caroline, feel free to weigh in on that. Is there anything more fascist than detaining people on army bases? Uh, one of the bases they're going to use is Camp Pendleton. And I don't know if people here have been to Camp Pendleton, but it's fairly isolated. It's hotter than hell. It's like 120, 125. They've shown the kinds of tents they're going to build for them. They've already started. Pendleton and a couple of other bases have already started installing uh, the camps. Uh, that deprives them of any access to the public and it deprives the public any access to them. So they'll be completely removed and in secrecy. It's important too to recognize that in Nazi Germany, the Jews were not the first. They came for the Romani people and the Romani were very, very isolated. And they were able to get away with that. They came for the union leaders. They came for the communists. They came for the immigrants. They came from the, for the immigrants. And everybody had to wear a different color, identifying them in the camps. We know there is a history of degradation and dehumanization. We know what that means, and we know what that looks like. And that looks like the removal of families. It looks like the destruction of villages. It looks like the dehumanization of peoples. It looks like the violation of human rights. And we absolutely, 100%, stand with the Jews. 
stand in absolute opposition to it. And we also call upon all good peoples of conscience, all good peoples to recognize what the United States has done to create the crisis, to create the refugees that are right now supposedly trying to flee an unjust situation. Who created that situation? USA! 56 military interventions in Latin America destabilizing the area. For what? For what reason? Profit! Profit! Imperialism! Imperialism! Empire! Why do we have refugees? Why do we have families even leaving their homelands? Everyone has a right to be in their homeland. But they are creating situations where it is unsafe. They are destroying the water, they are destroying the land, they are destroying the air that they breathe, and there is violence all around. Whether you are from Guatemala, Colombia, Puerto Rico, Cuba, we unite with you. We stand beside you in demanding that they recognize your humanity. Whether you are from Okinawa, the Philippines, whether you're Ainu, Maori, Marshallese, Chukis, Tahitian, whether you are North Korean, we know the violence of United States Empire if you are Kanaka Maoli. And we stand in solidarity right now while RIMPAC shows off their weapons of war in order to defend their profit-making complexes. Hawaii is now the center point for their selling of these weapons of war to further destabilize other nations, other brown people throughout the world. And they do that by expanding their military complex here in Hawaii. So we here as Kanaka Maoli make the connections. We know what it means. The violence in Iraq is the violence in Hawaii. Ew. The violence in Palestine is violence in Hawaii. Ew. For the first time, Israel is joining in the RIMPAC exercises because we know what's happening. The United States is consolidating their allies in preparation for war. Which war? Choose. Is it war in the Middle East? Yes. Is it war in South America and Central America? Yes. Is it war in the Pacific? Yes. Is it war in Africa? Yes. Is it war in Asia and against Russia? Yes. So we stand in solidarity against the destabilization and dehumanization for all First Peoples, all peoples of conscience, all together. We unite. Eyo malamapono imo halamo. Aloha aina. Just before we we head out, um, thank you so much, Kalama, for everything that you just said and really grounding it back in always to to what we're doing here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yeah. Aloha Aina. Uh, before we leave, I just wanted to offer this song. Uh, you know, we've been talking so much about these keiki, these kamali'i that are suffering right now and that are ripped away from their ohana. And so before I go, I was just playing this song over and over again in my head. It was written by my mom. And she wrote it for me before my womanhood ceremony. And she wrote it to always tell me and remind me that I am a sacred being. And that our kama, those who are coming up, our next seven generations, we're raising, we're raising sacred, sacred beings coming into this realm to create change and to do good things and to bring around the good things in this world. Can you hear me? Because <laughs> I, I keep on seeing people saying, no, you can't hear me. Um, if you want, come a little closer. Um, and this song, uh, it says how precious our next seven generations are, how precious our kama are, our pepe. And so I've been thinking about that all day today. 
and really carrying that in my heart. And so if you could just join me and put your hands up and send all of your good energy to the hearts of these children, because that's why we're here. What's happening is so wrong. It's so heavy to separate these kamali'i from their families. So to pray and to lift up the mothers and the fathers, the aunties, the uncles, and all of these keiki. And to really call upon our humanity across the world, our empathy, our ability to still feel and still love and still know compassion. So just put that out there and call upon this because I know that that energy going out is going around the world, no matter how big or small we think we are. Just our intention to call for empathy. That's real and that's power. And so here's Hiva Hiva. Hiva Hiva La Thank <laughs> you. 